Hey, what's up, everybody? Welcome right. to Tone Talk with Mark Uzanski and Dave Friedman. We've got Howard Kaplan. How are you, Howard? I'm doing great. I'm glad to be here and look forward to the conversation that we have. Yeah, same here. Same here. Uh, I've uh, I've known about you for a really long time, actually. Or let's say for since uh, I've been into the EVA champs for, uh -huh. for a while. So you know. Um, in fact, I reached out to you a long, long time ago um, when I was on another show. Uh -huh. That was that was Evie, but you, you, when you were working for for Fender, uh -huh. and you said you couldn't talk until after you left the company. You know, you oh, were. I don't remember that. Company. No, no, it was a long. It was a while, like six years ago. So oh, okay, or longer. So um, I can answer your question now. <laughs> yeah, now you can. I'm I'm happy to have you on the on my show. So yeah, um, except Mark can't remember the question now. <laughs> No, whatever. Uh, <laughs> it was. Yeah, it's been it's been years, so Mark can't remember that. Yeah, no, uh, I I've got them all stored up here. So, but yeah, thanks everybody for uh, whoever's watching. We appreciate it. Uh, B, I see BB in the chat. We've got a bunch of other folks. First off, right off the bat, just make sure you guys check out our Sweetwater link below. Um, and if you want to buy anything, you can you know click that link and. We end up getting a little kickback, you know, a little commission on that, but the price is the same for you, and uh, we appreciate that. It helps support our channel. And then also we have fixpedalboards.com. Check out fixpedalboards.com. We're going to be coming out soon uh, with uh, – well, he's going to have new products on the site, and we're also going to be featuring it on a, a pedal board uh, of mine. So yeah, pedal board points. build finally that we hinted about years ago. Yeah, <laughs> seems years ago. <laughs> Might have been years ago. It was about a year ago. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> We're gonna finally do it. Yeah. So I'm looking forward to that. So so yeah, fixpedalboards.com. Check them out and make sure you hit subscribe and the like. Okay. So with all that said, um, how was everybody's week? Ah, uh, same for me. Yeah, same old shit. Two days yeah. at the factory testing a lot of amps oh yeah and try to weed through funky tubes <laughs> you have trouble getting getting tubes like, uh uh, uh we have tubes it's just a question of if they're any good <laughs> that's true um yeah it's work it's it's working out yeah two tube, tube, tubes are a little bit of an issue Prices have gone through the roof on Russian tubes. Forget that. I mean, uh, oh yeah, for sure. What what once was uh, wholesale, you know, nine dollars is now nineteen dollars. <laughs> so, you know, that's that's crazy. <laughs> yeah, that is crazy. So, uh, Howard, you're um, you're now doing your own thing. You're um, yeah, I started an LLC. <clears throat> a couple of months after I retired, which was a year and a half ago, April 1st. And the idea was to, to do uh, updates to EDA champs, uh, some special ones that I developed. And I'm working out of Guitar Pickers, which is a place in Scottsdale, Arizona. They sell, they resell vintage guitars and amps. And I do repair work for them. Uh, you know, it's part of the being able to have my bench there, you know. Well, that's cool. So, I think yeah. I've heard of them. I've heard of their shop. Yeah, they're 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 pretty well known. Al Lieberman runs it, and Sherilyn Gerhardt is the luthier. Mm. He builds full customs, but he gets a lot of business. People got coming in there, you know, working on their guitars. Yeah. And they have vintage gear too, or they have a lot of vintage amps and and vintage a lot of vintage guitars. He's got some pretty high high end guitars hanging on the wall. He probably has a at least a hundred guitars in there, and he sells he sells Nash. Oh yeah, those are nice. Yeah, nice guitars. Yeah, and Sherilyn, he makes uh, Tele Tele uh, clones. You know, so but he does mostly the luthier stuff, fixing things, and when a guitar comes in, he he reviews it and makes sure you know everything's working right before they put it up for sale. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's pretty cool. So you, you decided to retire and then go back into business? Uh, you know, I don't like to be bored. <laughs> I like to be busy. Uh, it's a little slower than I expected. 
but I, I got I got a tough couple tough ones on my uh, on my workbench now. An old uh, silver tone. Uh, oh yeah. Guy wants it totally rebuilt and redone, and and then a uh, an Ampeg Gemini one E12 chassis where the the reverb pan died. Oh, that's hard to get. They, right? they used Gibbs reverb pans, which were Hammond. Uh huh. Mm. So there was, like somehow I got contact with a guy in California who had like ten of them. Oh wow! He shipped me one just for the cost of the shipping. So I oh, got that's a, cool. I go in tomorrow and plug it in, and hopefully that'll put the Ampeg to bed and I'll be able to return it to the guy. But, you know, I get all kinds of stuff. Fender, a lot of fenders, mm -hmm. uh, EVH here and there, you know. So, yeah, it's uh, definitely the hardest thing about old repairs is getting the information. Line, line uh, not line six, Mesa Boogie, impossible to get to get information from them. Uh, yeah, sometimes, yeah. Sometimes, yeah. You got to know the right people. Like I had a, a Mesa Boogie uh, Mark Five, Mark Four, mm -hmm. tube amp, and the, the pots were bad. I had to wait a month and a half to get the controls. Really? And then, one, and then one didn't have the switch on the back, so I had to transfer a switch to the back. A lot of theirs have a pull switch. Yeah. yeah mm -hmm. so. And then the you know the EVH stuff I'm doing, um, but, but before I get into the EVH stuff, I wanna I wanna Shout out for uh, James Brown. Oh, was, James. James Brown, he's, I don't know if he's online, but he's he was the original PV5150 guy. Yeah, the OG5150. Yeah, yeah. And he, uh, two years ago, I think, is when, when I was going to announce I'd be retiring. Mm -hmm. They looked you know, out there to see what they could do, and they James lived in Atlanta and uh, contacted him, and he said he'd, he'd love to come to work with Fender and Work on EDH. Now, I started when that amp was first developed, working with Mike Ulrich. Yeah, Mike Ulrich was uh, originally my my boss. Yeah, yeah he, was he the, the original, original designer of the first amp? No, Mike. Me, no. Um, no, Mike was. Uh, he wasn't really the designer. The designer of that first hundred watt head was Matt Wilkins. Oh, okay. Okay, and there that was. Um, yeah, Matt is a, is a he's been at Fender forever. Awesome engineer. Hmm. Personality wise, uh, him and Ed didn't see eye to eye. So, Got it. That, Mike asked me. They drafted me. I was working on Fender products right. for eight years or seven years. Mm -hmm. It said, "How would you like to work on EVH?" I said, "Sure, sounds good." It's tubes, I like tubes. So, <laughs> they, drafted me, they drafted me and. But I wanted to shout out to, to definitely to James Brown because he started the whole EDH legacy. Yeah. And then um, he went on to do his own company. I think it was called Amp Tweakers. Yeah, yeah. sure. Yeah. We've had James on our show. Yeah, yeah. James is great. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, he wrote me today. He says, have fun. You should have fun with those guys. Yeah, we had a, we, we, I think we had a beer at NAM one time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, James is a lot of fun. He's, he, he's on, awesome. We having lunch on Monday together. Oh, that's okay. cool. Yeah, because he's he moved out by you, right? Yeah, he's he lives here now, and uh, yeah, he's the the main guy. With, for, he took over what I was doing, right? Of course, obviously, he, you know he's he started the whole thing, and, right? Uh, they hired another young guy, uh, which I should mention, Alexander Shabilsky, which we call Xander. Mm. He's a tube. You know, he's been doing tubes since he's probably fourteen years old or something. Mm. So yeah, him and James. Took over that whole deal. Marketing guys are the same, but there's a lot. Of, there's been a lot of change in the in the management that Fender, which I don't really want to get into. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. So if he's listening, thanks, James and Xander, if you're out there. So, That's yeah. cool. Yeah, we had a lot of fun with James. And the mechanical engineer that worked with me, uh, Richard Barr, all twelve years we worked together. So hmm. he's he's still there. He's still at Fender. So. so how long were you at Fender? Uh, 18 years total. Ah, long time. That is a long time. I moved from Seattle right after 9-11. I worked at uh, Fluke Electronics from 1975 till right after 9-11. Hmm. Oh. Um, my boss 
that hired me there uh, worked at Thomas Organ, Thomas Vox, where I, that's where I met and how I got the connection back. Uh, actually, it started at Fluke. Uh, he, when I worked at, he was my boss at Thomas Organ. Al, Al Carlson was his name. And when I, I decided to move out of Chicago, so I contacted uh, him and, and I talked a little bit about where, what he was doing because he left Thomas to get back to Seattle. And he, because I was actually calling for a couple younger guys that wanted to move. And I was thinking about moving. He goes, why don't you come out? So I flew out to Seattle in end of 1974 and uh, winter. And it was crystal clear the whole time I was there. Unusual for Seattle. And I went home and told my wife then, I said, we're moving. Because <laughs> they offered me a job. Mm -hmm. But we got there in March 1975, and we didn't see the, the sun until three months later. <laughs> <laughs> now that sounds right. <laughs> yeah, that, yeah. So, yeah, that's how I got the connection. Uh, so from, from Seattle, when I got when I was working at um, Fluke, I worked there for four, 12 or 13 years. And then I left to go to a barcode company to work on barcode scanners and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. I got three, four years later, a call from some guys at Fluke said they're starting up a, a startup company, Fluke Networks. And that was going to be my ticket to be rich because <laughs> it was a startup endeavor. But then 9-11 happened and the whole thing just collapsed. All right. So that day that I got let go, 80 other guys. Why um maybe I'm just not putting two to get two together, but why did 9/11 affect the uh? The oh, business? I was working on network equipment, uh, infrastructure, and the whole thing collapsed. The whole huh. internet infrastructure thing, the business just you know, and the people that were actually getting the equipment were mostly government related people. Uh, and that Luke was a a small potato, and you know, companies that were doing networking stuff, net I see. networking gear. Right, right. So I got let go, and then I took out a roommate. At that time, I had uh, recently got divorced, and I took out a roommate to help. And he was a fender repair center in Seattle, luthier guy. So there was the connection to Fender. Ah, uh, oh, there you go. It was a his company was called Berlin Strings, hmm. and then I decided to branch out on my own. You know, I co I contacted the head of the service at Fender. Don Wiggins, and he said it, and I told him if there's ever something going on with needing an engineer, let me know. About three, four months later, I got a call from R and D manager there at, at Fender, and they took me down, interviewed me, and offered me the job. So I picked up and left uh, Seattle with my two cats, and, and that was the beginning of the Fender legacy for me. Oh boy! Isn't now, do you play guitar? No, <laughs> I tried. <laughs> no good. <laughs> no good. <laughs> I, I always find that I always find that so interesting with the uh, amp engineers that don't actually play anything. Yeah, it is weird. It, but it, I have a good ear, and never was a problem between Ed, Ed and myself. He just, you know, I just, when he would explain what he's trying to do, it just it would always click with me. Yeah, you know, convert that. Uh, it worked. It worked good. Yeah, I mean, ultimately, I mean, especially with the artist, I mean, they're the one who's playing, right? So mm -hmm. as long as you can make their vision come true, it doesn't really yeah. matter whether you can play or not, right? Yeah, I didn't, I didn't really meet that, and Mike Ulrich was the became the liaison mm -hmm. because there was that tension between the original hundred watt des designer and Ed, so Mike became the liaison. And yeah, he, he, he he was a he was a designer. He did. He did the metalhead at Fender. I remember mm -hmm. him doing that amp. But after I started to help, uh, you know, I, I just I just did it. But I don't even think Ed Ed knew who really was doing the work, but he was happy. And then Mike left. I think he went to some place in California. I think he's back in the Seattle area now. And, yeah, uh, he he went to a sound company. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, escapes me right now. What yeah, what? Company I, I heard he's back in, in the Phoenix area. Mm. So um, Jeff Carey, who took over the specialty group, um, was surprised that I had not really spent much time with Ed. 
So when Ed was inducted into that, uh, is that the, the music, uh, in the, at BC, there was a, an event that he was at where they interviewed him. Oh, yeah, yeah. I forget what that what was, was called. Yeah. Yeah. It was like a, an interview on stage where he was like talking to a reporter or something. Was it so Smith, Smith, Smithsonian something? Yeah, the Smithsonian. That's yeah. It. So that's when I met him and started to communicate more with him and go to his studio. And that was the beginning of, of a closer relationship with Ed. Mm -hmm. and, uh, he's a, he was a great guy. Awesome man. Really nice. nice. The last question that came up in the audience at that event was from a young kid. He asked, he asked Ed directly, he goes, if you could play with anybody, who would you play with? And he, Ed sort of sat there for a while, got quiet, and he stood up and he says, my father. Yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah. yeah I saw that, that video. Yeah. 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 That was good. Yeah. That was, yeah. Yeah. And he did, he did get the chance, the chance to uh, record with him yeah. on uh, Diver Down. Uh, I forget the name of the song, but um, anyway. His father played on, on it, which is pretty cool. Um, uh, we've got some questions okay. right off the bat. Uh, grumpy old rockers. Hello, Howard, from your favorite couple in Southern California, Andy and Lydia. Oh yeah, yeah. Andy's yeah. <laughs> he's not really grumpy. He's goofing off. Yeah, Andy's <laughs> been, uh, been very helpful to me promoting the the uh, my EVH mod, which basically takes the the fifty watt head. It, it has three channels. Right. But the, the originally, the tone stack was shared between one and two. Yeah. And three was separate. And I, from the very beginning, I thought that was a mistake. I said it, two and three should be shared because they're closer in game. Yeah. And so when you go from one to two on the original 50 watt head end combo, the volume jumps. So that. that Why did Ed want that? You know, he, he didn't really care about the clean channel at all. He was blue and red. Isn't it sort of a little bit left over from not necessarily the circuit, but the concept from from the original PV amp? Uh, because you know, it kind of shared clean and clean, clean and crunch. There was clean a switch, and and it just, yeah, you know, and it and it did sort of the same thing, same issue, and they had a higher gain, which uh, you know. I, you know something with and then burn you know yeah a super high game yeah that could be I'm I'm not sure yeah. but that's the way it started but the hundred watt head had three fully independent channels so you could, didn't have to yeah. worry about you can right. set them all by themselves and the and the original hundred watt head had uh, three presents no yeah. residents mm -hmm. because PV had a patent on the residents yeah until it, it had residents built. Not variable res resonance. Yeah, it was just fixed. Fixed resonance. Mm -hmm. And that was set up with a 4 by 12 cabinet that they offered. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so we yeah, so Andy, uh, I, I developed this. Uh, uh, as, as we move forward with the 50-watt series, um, we finally decided to address the volume jump by making dual concentric gain and volume controls. Mm -hmm. And we did that first on the EL34 head and the EL34, yeah, the EL34 head. Mm -hmm. So then we backfitted that into the, the 6L6, but we I designed it so the 6L6 products, combo and head, could be retrofitted with a kit, service center installable kit. So that's so then all of the 50 watt heads go, and amps going forward had dual concentric gain and volume. So you could you can obviously go from one to two mm -hmm. and, and balance the, the volume jump. Yeah, right, right, right. So I took I took that concept, which is the thing that I'm selling as an upgrade to have full um, all five controls, dual concentric. So I can do that update to anybody, any of the 50 watt heads, EL34 or 606. Oh, so concentric of, pots uh, across the channel. On all, five, on all five controls. So Andy was one of the first guys that he was a guinea pig for me. And, kind of and, fun to get those pots, isn't it? Yeah, that was one of the one of the issues because oh, that's yeah. another, <laughs> another good side talk. Um, when I joined the EVH group, 
they were using Noble and, and that, maybe CTS, or, or but, but not one brand. Mm-hmm. So there would be mixed controls and mm-hmm. amp, and that would there would be a, quite a bit of variability if you had put two amps side by side. So I decided, why don't we just use one brand and all the same date code within you know a range of time. So whenever I would ship an amp to Ed, I would make sure that it had the same, you know, they were built at the same time with the same date code, all noble controls. Mm-hmm. But when you go, when you do AB, that it was much more similar. Right. Although, you know, the controls are actually 20% range, but yeah. by doing that, it helped a lot, actually. Makes sense. So, um, so I understand the concentric pots. You have one meg concentric pots. Uh, but you have the other values too, 250 and, and well, that was, that was the five or 20 or whatever. Yeah. The, the tone controls, uh, were, were different, unusual values that Fender wasn't using. Yeah. So I had a good contact at Noble in, in Chicago. Uh-huh. Um, she offered to send me samples and I got 10 sets of oh, okay. all controls and, it worked out well. I laid out a circuit board. And I think Andy has one of the first ones that uses the noble controls. And then when I realized I only had 10 sets, so when I asked her, well, what's it going to cost to buy more? She goes, well, we, you got to buy 500 of each control. I go, that's a little out of my league. <laughs> so so I had to scramble. And I, I found a, a vendor locally here of alpha controls and he yeah. was able to get me what I needed. Yeah. Oh, that's they're, good. They're actually panel mount controls, dual yeah. concentric, but I, I, you know, I take the, I cut off the loops and, mm-hmm. and it's circuit board mountable. So I, yeah. Yeah. so I switched over to alpha. Oh, so that's, that's didn't know you can get those. <laughs> yeah. I, 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 might, I, I, might, I, might, I might, I might have to contact you about that. <laughs> they're called the dime, the dime series. It's they're small, they're small enough that I can put them on that board, and the board comes in from the top. Yeah. But the other problem, I'm, the other problem always is finding the knobs that work on concentric pots. Yeah, you got you hit it right on the head. <laughs> I mean, I I actually found some from some supplier that supplies some guitar stuff that's pretty cool and works okay, but really, really you should have them made. Yeah. He, <laughs> This guy has... Had, well, you had, can get the knobs from EVH, though. That they're using, No, right? because the EVH ones were specially tooled. And they, they won't work on the pots. They won't work because, because the amp, the, the combos are inverted chassis. Uh-huh. We designed the knob so you can use it at 180 degree. And right. An H slot on the inner knob. Oh, okay, got it. So it was not compatible. So, I, But I was able to get knobs from these people, too. Oh, they cool. Were, yeah. Oh, I'm gonna have to talk to you about that because I always do these custom modifications for people, and sometimes that would come very handy. <laughs> yeah. 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 Cool. Uh, so, yeah, Randy, uh, sorry, tech talk here. Yeah, Randy <laughs> helped, helped launch my uh, my options. You know, that's you cool. Do you have you have any? Uh, I I you know haven't looked at a website or anything. I assume somewhere there's something about this mod and stuff. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. There's a, it explains it all. I also offer, um, you know, online troubleshooting, you yeah. know, with, with video. You I know. think I think you might now wind up with more work after yeah. this. That was the idea. <laughs> yeah, right. exactly. That's the For idea. Sure. So all your EVH watt. guys that have a fifty watt. <laughs> well, you know, I have one right here. Uh oh, Mark's sending you his. It's done. Is it all? <laughs> Is it all single control? I can't see it. It's it's the uh, the stealth, so it's got. Oh, it's the, the stealth. So it has the dual centric control. on the you know channel one. Not the middle controls. Not the middle controls. Not no. the middle so, controls. Yeah. So we'll talk. We'll talk. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and Andy also developed what we called the the articulation mod to improve the articulation on channel two. Oh yeah. Yeah, that's a it's a nice mod. It gives it gives it a much better feel according to people that actually could feel that which i, I right. can't i could hear it but. yeah the the you know i so i came from the original amp you know when it first came out and working with ed and for me 
channel two on the original version, the OG version of the 50 was perfect. The PV one was perfect. No, 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 no. Oh. The Fender one. Well, the Fender one. Yeah, yeah the Fender right. one. Yeah. Uh, when when you basically you turn the gain to ten, and that was just the right amount, and yeah. and so then why would course, you want it any higher, right? <laughs> and then of course, and then of course, over the years, that became twice or three times the amount of gain. Yeah, yeah, that, that was the S version when Ed they boosted the gain yeah. on the combos, and he liked it. Mm -hmm. so I he know he always, he always wanted more. Yeah, more gain, more gain, more, That's more, 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 more of everything. Yeah. More whatever it is in his life, more. <laughs> <laughs> and then we did the whole Yale 34 series also. We basically did. Yeah. yeah. I thought we could have, uh, we, I know I could have designed it so you could switch the tubes. Sure. Mar marketing didn't want that. No. Yeah. Well. There's also some agency issues with that. Because if you, it really needs, I mean, you have to be careful about the bias because if it's not done right, and you switch to six L six from the L thirty fours, their their bias current would jump way up, and you get red plating. And mm -hmm. That's not good. So <laughs> we didn't separate them. So and then I did the lunchbox stuff too. I don't know if you guys mm. have seen those. There were three of those. Yeah, the little guys. The little guys. That sounds pretty good, actually. I, I have one of those in here for some someone brought in for repair. Uh, but there's my website thing. <laughs> Yep. So this one, this is uh, Howard's website. It is, uh, if you guys want to check it out, kaplansampservice.com. Yeah, that's me. So you can <laughs> find out about the mods and reach out to Howard. Um, so the question from uh, Lydia, and I forget the other guy's name. Andy. Andy. Andy um, they wanted to get your thoughts on PCB versus hand wired. You know, I, I'm of the school that. Um, if you hand wire everything and you can reproduce it and do it exactly the same way, that's great. But if that, you, if that usually doesn't happen, so a circuit board, in my opinion, locks everything down. So you know, there's no if ands or buts about the way the wires are routed. And I'm I'm a circuit board fan. Now, there's a caveat there is um, with tubes you don't want to, you know. You got to be careful how you attach tubes to a circuit board. And the way Fender and we did it, we have a triad around each tube with, with uh, you know, spacers that hold the tube socket. So if you're putting in tubes and you're wiggling it, you're not wiggling the board. Right. That's really important. And a lot of the, uh, when I worked on the 65 Princeton Reverb reissue, those original are hand-wired. The tubes are all mounted on the chassis and wires come over from the turret board. Right. So I designed the Princeton reverb reissue and the champ reissue I did mm. with that method. The board, the tubes were on the chassis. So when you change the tubes, you're not wiggling a circuit board. Right. Very important. The same thing with controls. If you have controls on a circuit board, you need to make sure that there's strain relief to the, to the front panel. Yeah. Not grabbing them and wiggling and breaking soldered joints. So that's my take on it. Yeah, it just you know, it just has to be. Yeah, just like if we have PC mounted sockets uh, for power tubes or something, yeah. uh, those things are bolted to the chassis. Right. There, there's no wiggling the circuit board. There's right. no nothing on the circuit right. board. Right. And yeah. not to mention our circuit board's super thick and plated through you know two ounce copper and. Okay. Yeah. So you guys got it. So it's not. It's not like the single layer uh, Deville boards, you know that yeah. <laughs> that are well, the copper rips right up. Fragile <laughs> when you look at it wrong. Yeah, it rips. Um, yeah. So that's yeah. My and, on that. Yeah. So it makes it more reliable. Yeah. Consistent. And I agree with Howard on that completely. I think a PC board is actually the better way to go for consistency, right. reliability. Um, okay, maybe it's a little harder to repair if something does happen. Yeah. Yeah. But I would say from amp to amp, it'll be more consistent. Right. Um, and frankly, these days, you know, like for instance, our pots that we were using in our amps, 
they they in in this day and age they are not as reliable as they once were yeah, i would rather true. use a pc mount pot which i know is actually more reliable mm. than some of the some of that full size hand wired pots that just up and fall apart tin whiskers and <laughs> fail and you know it's just like oh you have a bad pot that's what's wrong mm. i never had that years ago <laughs> Right. You know, pot pots still exist in Marshalls and other amps from 1965 yeah. that are still working perfectly fine. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, why is that? You know, and and frankly, also there's the human element of hand wired amps. Yeah. And let me tell you something, because I do a lot of them. Yeah. Human element is a big problem yeah. because people make mistakes, just plain as day. Mm -hmm. You can't have a line of genius builders it just doesn't work that way you know you these people are taught to build a certain portion of the amp but are they all the best no they're not they're they're you know they're not high dollar wor super high dollar workers they're a factory worker essentially you know okay. and and you're it just you're gonna have mistakes it's just gonna happen and then the other issue is from day to day, people change on the line and yeah. some sick. And this wire is closer to this wire now, or that wire is closer to that wire now. And there, oh, there's more capacitance when you push it that way, or if you move that wire that way, it oscillates. And, <laughs> and you know, it a piece and, and PC board, you can get much tighter, shorter signal path too. Right. I mean, like you can get literally on top of the tube. There's no signal path. It's almost like the end of each part is hitting the tube and hitting the pot. It's like so close. Mm -hmm. Also, yeah. if you want want to add a little money, you could get much better ground planes by doing multi layer boards. And, Absolutely. You no know, things mm -hmm. like that. Lower noise, everything. Uh, Will the real question for Howard? EVH fifty one. What's that? I'm reading it there. Oh, okay. Uh, EVH 5153 preamp tube, silver dot underneath for V1 and V2. How to find the same level of quality JJs? Is it luck of the draw? No, it's not luck of the draw. Um, before the before the before COVID and the supply chain issues, well, the EVH amps use all JJ tubes. They they buy them in bulk. They come unlabeled, and then they go through selection processes. EVH gets the best tubes for V1 and V2. And that's what the silver dot's all about. Mm -hmm. They go through a thing called the House of Pain. The tubes are put in there, and they're they're put under a lot of you know they're they're bombarded with high level sound in this thing they call the House of Pain, and they choose. The tubes that had the lowest microphonic and the lowest noise. Those get the silver dot and they become V1 and V2 or V1 and V4 if it's a 100 watt head. Uh, those are the two high gain tubes. And also the covers on those, they get a foam insert instead of a spring insert. That helps with transmission of vibration into the tube. So that's it's not a luck of the draw, and there and that tube is those tubes are available. They should be available on the EVH gear site. Those those high those selected tubes. On the, Still, JJ's? well, I don't. You know, I've been gone a year and a half. I have no idea if those are really available because a lot of things have changed because since of the war. Change. Yeah, since the war. But it's yeah. been my experience that. There's there's uh, places out there that sell tubes that they say are you know screened and low noise. Mm -hmm. So if you can get those and you need to replace V1 and V2, I would use those. But my experience is that the preamp tubes are really reliable. It's the, the, yeah the power, power tubes that tend to the I think preamp tubes sort of if they fail it'll be quick right at the beginning. Yeah, my experience, but 
I think V1 and V2, you know, in those amps, I mean, I think the m most JJs are relatively low microphonic. Yes, they are. It, yes. it, you know, if I get a box of JJs, it's, you know, I, you know, I might get 10 that are too microphonic or something out of a right. box of 100. So, and, and most don't really have noise or anything. Most of them are quite consistent, uh, more, yeah. more consistent than almost anything. Yeah. Um, so... I, you know, you can you can buy some. You can buy. You can go places and buy tested, pre-tested for. They, there's some tube vendors that'll test for microphonics and test for everything. You know, you can buy some JJ somewhere. It's not really. Mm. Yeah, you don't have to. You don't have to go to vendor. Right? Yeah, but the, they did make them available if you want them. Yeah. Gotcha. Uh, you know, a lot Davis, of guys, they don't, they don't even, the thing is, the thing that was bad is they don't even know. It's like okay. They're not mm. labeled. They're not. They're not labeled specially, except for the dot. Right. So that it got out there by the folklore from from me. <laughs> <laughs> well, good. It's, uh, I, special, I didn't. I didn't know about that either. Special dot. Yeah. That's cool. I always tell people they're all the same, just screened a little bit more. <laughs> <laughs> uh, thank you for answering my question earlier, Dave. Uh, Howard, are there any oddball, weird amps that you like that people might not expect? EVH apps are we talking about? Or I think he's just saying any, any apps. apps. Well, really, I've you know, I've spent you know, 12, 13 years just working on EVH amps, so I, I don't have a lot of experience with other other amps, and I'm not a, I'm not a player, so I guess I can't really recommend anything. Gotcha. Oddball weird amps. Hmm. I remember we got one time a. Uh, from JJ, actually, some hand-wired, beautiful amps. I don't know if they were trying to sell them to Fender as a as a market niche, but they were, I never, you know, they sounded great. They looked awesome when you open them up, but most people don't really care that much what the inside looks like, as long right. as it sounds good. Yeah. So, so I don't have a, I don't really have an answer for that one. Sorry. I'm trying to think myself for me, oddball. Yeah, you've done a lot of stuff, David. Yeah, I I work on all sorts of crap for years. Um, <laughs> hmm. You know, some some of the stuff that uh, uh, James Brown had worked on from PV were pretty cool. The PV VTM series. That's an old amp that kind of was under the radar. That was kind of a neat amp, uh, or at least the concept of it. Mm -hmm. Um. Yeah. Those old butcher butcher amps that PV made were kind of, were actually cool. That was like a JC made hundred essentially, and that one sound sounded pretty good. I I had an opportunity to retube one recently. Uh, what about uh, the? He worked on the Satriani stuff. Yeah. Uh, uh no, not so much. Um, I've got one of those at the guitar pickers now. One oh of yeah, original, one of the ones that uh, he used on tour. Oh okay. James. Uh, James signed it and everything. He came in, and there was two of them that he took on tour. Satriani. Other oddball amps. Uh, some old trainer amps are kind of cool. Mm -hmm. Um, they were built like a tank. Uh, and the uh, Lab Series amp. I don't know pretty, those. Pretty pretty cool. That's what uh, Ty Tabor used for years. Uh, off the top of my head, I can't think of anything else. Yeah. Okay. Um, I really, I get some of those really oddball ones, like the the Sears Silvertone ones. They sound yeah, good. those are great. Those are they awesome. Sound good. They sound good, but you know, it's like they don't look very nice. <laughs> you know? mm -hmm. But they, I, I was surprised how good. It, my brother was a was a guitar buff. His younger brother, my younger brother, mm -hmm. he was always sending me these weird things to fix for him, including mm -hmm. Silvertones and. Uh, yeah, I, I've never played one, but I hear they're cool. Oh, they, you crank those things up; they sound great. Yeah, oh, yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's cool. Well, uh, the one I got, they had stuck in uh, their six v sixes. They had put in these, I guess Fender, maybe Groove Tube, made these. Oh, wait a minute! Some silver tones are six L sixes, depending on. Yeah, these were six, but they had a tube, like a, a hot six v six, which was really a six L six. Right. And that's probably not a good idea because the filament current is much higher. 
So I, I put them back to 66s, standard 66s. Yeah. There's some there's a lot of variants of the six these the 6L6 too. The 6L6S. There's a low power 6L6. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. I would never ever in a million years do an amp that has six V6s in it yeah. today. Yeah, today, yeah. It's, it's because point, right? well you have JJ six V sixes, which are actually great tubes, yeah. but they rattle like hell in a combo, so you can't really use those. Oh, okay. So, so, so that, so then you have, uh, you have, you know, Sovtech EH, which work pretty well, but now with this situation, are really kind of in upheaval right now. Mm -hmm. And then they're, you know, the Chinese ones were never good, and they went, you know, Shogang went away. Yeah, they burned out. And <laughs> and uh, well, they're coming back evidently, but well, they're not there yet. Um. Did you ever use the winged C? Six V six? The six L six winged C. Oh yeah, six L six, yeah. yeah Ed did too for that. a while. That was a pretty good too. Yeah, Ed Ed did for a while Ed too. Did, used yeah. those for a while. He was not happy when they said we couldn't get him anymore. Yeah. Yeah, I remember because I was up at fifty one fifty and listening to tubes with Matt. No yeah. <laughs> we, we listened to JJ's across the board and then we're like, Yeah, that sounds good. Okay. <laughs> Mm -hmm. um uh yeah so i mean you know the 6v6 is just not really much out there or your choices and you're really limited right now so if you can't get sovtech branded 6v6s you're kind of screwed mm -hmm. so there's no way yeah interesting so uh tavera's project thanks for the super chat um Question for Howard. Was there a change to the EVH3 head channel 2 to sound more like channel 3, and what year did that happen? Well, that was when the 100S was introduced. Uh, Year-wise, it's probably six years ago. Hmm. And it wasn't really intended to sound like channel 3. It was just Ed wanted the channel, what we did on the combo, the increased channel 2 gain. That's what he wanted, and that's what we did. And we didn't really... It wasn't voiced any differently, but it's it had more gain. It was just more. It was just more gain. That's what happened. That's what, I think that's what he's referring to. Yeah. Okay. Uh, it, I, the, the tone stack on channel three is different than channel two, mm -hmm. and we didn't we didn't change anything in the tone stack. It was just primarily the gain. Yeah. And and we used um, the channel one V one in, in the hundred watt head. And in both heads, the 50 watt heads is split between channel three and channel one and two. But on the S, channel two and three share the first half of V1, and channel one is separate. Mm -hmm. That allowed us to make channel one cleaner without, without impacting channel two and three. Mm. Right. But, uh, DL 34s, um, when they came out, they pushed to have channel one be cleaner. And so we did do that. Yeah. That was that was part of the EL34 series. Mm -hmm. Now there's a mod that people tend to do on the EL34 blue channel, that's, right? That, uh, yeah, that, that's a controversial subject. Uh, when we went down there to approve the 50 watt EL34 head, uh, Ed, Ed wanted um, channel two to be darker so we we made a change and I, I didn't like it it didn't sound good to me but he liked it it, it, it has a dip it has mm -hmm. a, a what do they call it a notch mm -hmm. and that that was done by making a coupling capacitor bigger from mm -hmm. the one that drove uh, channel two so um, when, he, when the EL34 head came out and it was starting to be reviewed on the web, there were guys that saying they don't, they don't understand why Channel 2 is so dark. I was one of them. You were one of them? Yeah, yeah. I, I bought it. I bought the head and then I, before people were doing mods to it, I ended up selling it because I was just okay. like, oh, it's, you know, that's why I ended up getting the stealth. Okay. Because it was just, uh, it was a bit more the sound in my head of what I wanted. Yeah. So I was like, okay. Uh, that, 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 I, I wanted to change it, but marketing overruled me because I had approved it. 
Mm -hmm. I understood that. So, um, yeah, but now people so the word got out. out about removing that capacitor C137, clip it out, and the preamp was back to what the 606 version was. Hmm. Quite simple, one yeah. capacitor. But there's actually guys that liked like it. it. Them. Liked it that way. About it was about 50 50. Uh, you yeah. can't win. You can't, can't win. win. With, we can't win with bright and dark. I've learned. Yeah. So someone will say my amp's dark, and then I I make a brighter amp, and then they say, oh no, it's too bright. <laughs> and I'm like, what do you want? <laughs> That's why we give you tone. Fuck. <laughs> can't win. Can't win. <laughs> yep. Uh, Jay well, to this day, the EO 3450 watt head still has C137 in there. Uh, there you go. There you go. No, and, that's the way Ed wanted it. And that's the way I keep it. Yep. Uh, um, Dave, I know uh, around the time of 1984, EVH used an MXR rack mount delay. Did he use one or two? And did he use them in front of the amp or in between the Marshall and the H&H &H V800? Uh, that's a very good question. I'm assuming, knowing that delay, I'm assuming it was between the Marshall and the V800. Uh, because he was using the V800s at that time. And from what I understand, he was using one cabinet as a dry load okay. off the amp. So I'm pretty positive that a line out was feeding those delays. And I think there was two, if I recall. Okay. Hmm. Stephen Douglas, Howard, why did Fender originally make the EVH 50 watt in Vietnam and why ultimately did they decide to make them in Mexico again? I have That's a Vietnam good. version. Yeah, okay. I have one too, signed by Ed. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah, sitting right here in my, my little office here. That's cool. Um, it was a cost thing, you know, and, and the factory at that time was pretty busy. So phasing in a new amp into the and Sonata factory was going to be difficult. But I laid out all the circuit boards and I made sure that what I did was compatible with the Ensenada process. Okay. Mm -hmm. Just in case things didn't work out in Vietnam. And what happened in Vietnam was they wanted us to buy, they wanted Fender to buy a half a container at a time of amps. That's a lot of amps to suddenly ship. And if there's an issue in production, we'd have to send their engineers to the warehouse, which at that time was uh, Ontario, California, and do rework. And the risk was pretty high, so they, and they didn't want to place that big of an order. So in parallel, we worked real quickly and did a prototype run down in Ensenada, and it worked out really well, so we decided um, and we have more control over things because if something goes wrong in Ensenada, it's just mm -hmm. a matter of flying to San Diego and driving there. Yeah. But it, it, it made sense to do that. Not that this, they did a great job of building the amps. The only differences were metric hardware, hardware and the screws and the way they mounted the front panel LEDs. It's the only difference. Circuit boards, transformers were the same, Schumacher. The capacitors were all the same. All that, you know, and the OT and the PT were made by Schumacher. So that it was it was a no-brainer in terms of of building it. So so we cut off the purchasing of the Vietnam version. Got it. Gotcha. Yeah. Um let's see. So what other amps did you, before I get to the next super chat, um, what other amps did you work on when you, when you were a Fender before you switched over to uh, okay. EVH? The, well, the first thing I did was, uh, the, it was called the Ultralight series, Ultralight Jazz, Ma Jazz Master. Hmm. You can find it out there somewhere. It's a, it probably the front panel was like five inches high by about nine inches wide. It was uh, 250 watts. And um, the, it, it was a totally analog two-channel amp that I worked. I worked on the Jazz Master version, and there was another engineer who worked on the Acoustasonic version. And the idea was you have an amp that's very light, 
in a little bag and your speaker is also made out of very light material. And you can walk into a gig with two things under your arm and go play. Yeah. It was, cla- it was a class D 250 watt output, a hundred, two different 125 watt. There it is. That's it. Yeah. Oh, and that, and the, the head has a magnetic latch. So if you tilt the cabinet, it, it, there was, I think they patented that actually. Yeah. That's, wow. a, that's a cool little amp. It was a, and it had, it had, di- it had a digital um, effects, you know, a chorus, vibrato, but primarily it was an analog, full preamp, two different channels, high gain, low gain. It had high, it had high gain. I was wondering if it would. Yeah, the bottom channel there, the bottom row was high gain, huh. not like the EVA champs, but higher gain. Right, yeah. right, right. More yeah, fender, that's, that's fender style. Know, that was the first thing I worked on, and then after that, I went to uh, I think a GDEC Junior, which was a pretty uh, a digital uh, effects amp and analog type front end, and then uh, the fifty seven Champ, the Clapton version. I worked on that. Hmm. Princeton Reverb 65 reissue. Mm-hmm. I worked on that. And so I, be, one second I, before you go back to the Clapton one, did you work with Clapton on that or was it just? No, I, mar- the marketing guys did all that. And right. all, the only difference from it to the, the standard 57 reissue was he had a, a power attenuator put on it. Hmm. So can, low power thing. It just. You know, a passive attenuator, not anything active. But the the circuitry and everything was the same. Same, yeah. Right, and, and the the look was a little different because it had his name on there and everything. Right, right, right. Got and it. then I did. Uh, did I say the GDEC Junior? I worked. Yeah, on you it. mentioned that. It was a yeah. digital one. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And right about that time is when they started talking to me about EVH. So it was the first six years. Gotcha. Well, speaking of variable power, by the way, the the combo um, has built in a digital reverb, a very nice digital reverb, and it has a five to fifty watt variable power, not not an attenuator, true variable power. And I did that by uh, varying the screen voltage on power tubes. If you do that, you basically get a tube that sounds the same the way it distorts, but has lower power capability, and you're you're dissipating the power in the tube rather than passively, hmm. you know, in some kind of resistor bank. Mm-hmm. And it's continuously variable. That was, a lot of guys like that feature. Just yeah. the screen voltage to the, the, the power tubes. Power tubes. Yeah. Power tube. yeah. Makes sense. Does it make it more um, like almost like a variac kind of thing, a bit more squishy or, you know? No, that was, it, it actually distorts stores sort of the same way as you drop that screen voltage mm-hmm. it's just like a making a lower power output power tube you have to mm-hmm. lower the input to it you can't mm-hmm. overdrive it but that's part of the control gotcha oh and you somebody you just mentioned the brown sound thing i haven't talked about that yet the, uh, ed was always fooling with variax to get mm-hmm. different sounds and and if you if you take a variac to an amp today and you lower the voltage down that low it'll stop working because there's regulators in there for logic and but the primary part of the of the brown sound was the lowering of the filament voltage in the power. yes it makes it sound different yes. so all of the evh amps that i worked on including the 100 the filament voltages are 5.3 volts mm-hmm. xl6 versions that, a there's sound. a super chat regarding this mark there is yeah, is, it, is this the one right here? Uh, DSL. The yeah, which, which, which brings the mojo. Yeah, the, so so yes, I was going to say this. The just changing the voltage to the amp is not it. It really is the the lowering of those heaters really change changes how the amp. Sounds. It's a feel thing. It's a sound and a feel thing. Right, right. Um, it's hard to explain, uh, but uh, yes, my experience and I've and I've experimented with this at great length is uh-huh. it does change 
how the amp responds, the lowering of the heaters, just the heaters right. alone, even. Just the heaters. That's all yeah. we did. Yeah. And the, the downside is it lowers the life of the tube. Unfortunately. Maybe. Well, it does because it does that castle stripping stuff. Well, maybe. There's a lot of controversy. Well, it depends on how you, you know, I mean, power tubes go anyway. You know, you can't use a power yeah. tube. I mean, I, you know, I, I used an amp for a million years at 90 volts, an old Marshall with, with the original tubes in it forever. And it was and fine. It still, it still yeah. Work? Well, yeah. Cool. yeah. Hmm. But uh, that's, that's the essence of the Brown sound that was moved into production. Yeah. Now on the EL34 version, I, when we started working on that, I sent him prototypes that had the lower filament voltage, and he didn't like that sound with the EL34 tubes. Not so we didn't do it. So we didn't do it on those. That whole series has full filament voltage. Nah. So what was the, the first EVH amp that you worked on? The 50 watt head. The EL34. No, the 6 l Original, the 6 l The Vietnam one. The one we oh, just I see. Had. I got you. Okay. Yeah. And then what was the last amp that you worked on? Uh, well, actually, I worked on one of the Iconics with James, but mm. I can't take credit for that. He was the project manager. Uh, the LBXS, I think it was. That was the last oh, one. Okay, the lunchbox. Did you, but you worked on the 50-watt Stealth, too, right? Yes, definitely. Gotcha. Okay. Um, Oh, by the way, uh, hap uh, I was going to say happy birthday. I don't know why I was going to say that. Uh, <laughs> uh, hi, Ben Coombs. How you doing, Ben and Amanda? Uh, they're always uh, always real supportive of the show. Nice people. Okay. Um, yes. Uh, let's see. R Rusty Shackleford, thank you for the super chat. Hey, guys, some people recommend mixing V30s with greenbacks. Uh, yes, I, th I think it sounds great. Dave does that. While others say the V30 will overpower the greenback, can you explain which is true and why? Well, technically, that might be true. Um, uh, but in, in my cabinets, my standard cabinets, I use greenbacks on the top speakers of the cabinet uh -huh. and vintage 30s on the bottom speakers of the cabinet. And the, and the reason or the, well, how I came about with this mix stems from a million years ago working with jerry cantrell um when i did his systems years ago uh, i mean a million years ago like in the early 90s um we determined that he liked a 25 watt greenback 4x12 and a vintage 30 4x12 on the other side it was a stereo rig and he liked both so uh it was a beautiful blend because Anything a V30 had, a greenback didn't, and vice versa. So it was a beautiful blend. So when I decided to do cabinets, I'm like, let's let's blend a couple vintage 30s, which tend to be a little punchy and a little on the harsh side, and let's blend that with the greenback, which is a little more scooped and a little more woody sounding. Uh, but I was thinking, let's put the harsher speaker down at the floor where you're not going to hear it. So it's not in your face as much. It's not in your face. You're not going to hear it. Uh -huh. And then the, the the greenback speaker is a little nicer. It's a little up higher. Chances are you're going to hear it more. And uh, it worked out really well. Is there that much of a dB difference between the two speakers? Not that much, really. On so paper, it looks like there is, but it's not as much as you think. It's kind of hard to tell, to be honest. Yeah, it sounds great to me. So I mean, the blend works really well. So that's how that's how I do it. So that's your four by twelve cabinet. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. I've shipped them for years, and people tend to love them. So this, I mean, you can order it with all greenbacks or all vintage thirties, but generally the standard is the blend. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it works good. It's only a hundred watt cabinet though with the blend because it's only based on the lower wattage speakers. So, mm. so Kurt Snyder wants to know, and I was going to ask as well. Um, uh, if you can tell us, you know, how did you work directly with Ed? So how was the, um, you know, the process of working with Ed on the well, amps? After I got him, I mean, Mike Allert used to be the guy that would go there mm -hmm. and, and, and propose new products to him, along with the marketing guys. Mm -hmm. And then they'd come back and I'd, I'd work on the design and we'd send off stuff. But after that, um, the Smithsonian event, I would go there and 
he would play and Matt Brock would play and we discuss things and well, I want this or I want that. And so it was a direct involvement. And he, he'd call now and then and say, oh, I changed, I'm thinking about this. Do you think you could do that or that? Yeah. So it was, it was direct communication, but most of it happened going to his studio. So we, we'd go over there mm-hmm. with the prototypes and we'd set them up and, and, uh, you know, him and Matt Brock would listen and then they would make comments and do you think he could do this or do that? And it was rare to do the changes on the spot because that, that's what happened with the, um, the, the original S version. Uh, uh, Mike Ulrich mm-hmm. pumped the game of Channel 2 up and Ed really liked it. But when it got back to me, I said, you know, there's something that's not quite right here. Uh, I, there's an interaction of the controls. Mm-hmm. Between, and uh, it's really subtle, but it's no, there's some people have noticed that over the years. That if you change the game of Channel 3, it affects 2. Is that on the 50 or on the 100? On the 100. Oh. And in true EVH fashion, it was left that way, right? It was left that way. Yeah. Right. It's not a big deal, but uh, that's why I. it was better that I would be there if they were making changes. Mm-hmm. I could I could, I could, could see, because you know, I'd have the schematic, I could see the interaction stuff. Yeah, possibly. Right, right. And then if you, yeah, so. So. But, yeah, uh, go Go ahead. So when you were bringing over a, you know, a prototype, would he just plug in and play? Would he play with the band? You know, no. would he be playing with anybody? Just or just himself, just playing. Just him. It was always him just in the studio. Him. Yeah, him in the studio, mm. which is uh, yeah. You've been there, I'm sure, David. Many a time. Yeah. Many a time, and and I remember. I think I remember when that change happened. When Mike was, Mike made that change. <laughs> Yeah, you do, huh? uh, yeah. I, there was there was a, there was a time when I saw Mike quite frequently. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I've never been to Ed's place, and I'm yeah, quite well. quite sad about it. <laughs> so I'm left out of the club. You're left uh, out of the club, unfortunately. You know, he, uh, he, he was you know, he definitely I he you know after he got sober and stuff he became a really nice to work with really. As a, that's a whole different person really, yeah it, it, he changed totally yeah totally different person yeah where you were you you started working with him before that happened though right yes yes uh-huh. i saw the totally different person yeah, yeah. i different remember person. the first time i met him he was there on the have you been were you at this uh chaparral place ever you know on fender chaparral no uh no a big sound room there and no. ed, it's the first time i met ed he was there listening to some products and he was, you know, he was lit. <laughs> and uh, the boss of the R and D at that time, he was pretty conservative. Mm-hmm. And he, it, it didn't sit well with him. So, and then mm-hmm. uh, he left the room, not Ed. And mm-hmm. Ed said, uh, who is that guy? He sure is uptight. <laughs> so, said, you know, so that was, but, you know, he's he's still, even though he, he was that way, he was able to get across what he really wanted something to sound like. Sure. Sometimes Absolutely. tough to work with, but then it got better as he got cleaner, you know. Yes. Yeah. Makes sense. Absolutely. You know? and, right. And it was, you know, sad to see him get sick and go through all that. And yeah, of course. Was, yeah, I know. Super sad. As well, you know, he's missed. Yeah. Yeah, a hundred percent. Hundred percent. I want to hear uh, his his son Wolfgang over here in Tempe a few mm-hmm. months ago. Oh yeah, he went. Me, yeah, he's 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 got a really good voice. Oh yeah, he he won't he doesn't play any of his dad's stuff, which mm-hmm. I understand. Yeah. No, but he did he did at a you know the Foo Fighters tribute concert. Yeah, right, he did he did do that. Right? He did great, which he did amazing. Yeah, no, he's fantastic. good. Really good. Yeah, he's talented. I went to see him also. He opened up uh, for Guns N' Roses uh-huh. uh, down here, and uh, which was cool. And then afterward, he came out with Guns N' Roses and played with them, which was a, uh-huh. was a cool, cool show. Um, yeah, very talented player. He's really good. And he plays 
all the instruments too. So right. you know. uh, you've got Zach Kerkorian. Thanks for the super chat. Howard at Fender during the Vibro King production. No, I was not there then. No. Oh, no. Okay. All right. Um, that was pretty cool amp, actually. The Vibro King. Yeah. yeah. I've worked on a. I've worked on a couple of them. Obviously, it's, it was kind of cool sounding. It was kind of a neat thing. Uh huh. I see. Here's uh, J. Buss' question. We a we answered that before. Mm -hmm. oh, the rack mount thing, yeah. Yep. Uh, we've got Rob's tone zone. Thanks, Rob. Uh, Dave, thanks for always returning emails. I told you I wanted to send you a bottle, bourbon or scotch. And what's your thoughts on the Digitech hardware DL8? Thinking I may try the Lukather two delay trick. Uh, Digitech hardware DL8 is awesome. Um, it was a just a you know, a kind of lexicon algorithms delay pedal that Digitech made for a while that was just really juicy sounding, really good sounding delay. So, yeah, get it. I have one here somewhere in a box. Hmm. All the pedals are in bins in the hallway. <laughs> I have so many pedals. I'm going to do a sale soon. You do Guys, too. I'm going to do a big sale. Um, but, um, bourbon or scotch not bourbon uh rye or scotch <laughs> and if you're if you're you know uh belvini scotch i love uh lagavulin uh lefroig but my wife gets upset at that one this mm -hmm. stinks like burnt wood <laughs> <laughs> Because it comes out your pores. <laughs> That's funny. No, it's seriously like if you just smell it, it's it's, it's like real smoky. It's real smoky. Well, Lagavulin smoky too, but it doesn't quite have the same kick as uh, that. Mm. Patrick Miller, um, Howard, was it a conscious decision that Fender wanted a slightly more scoop sounding tone for the '65 Princeton reissue compared to the original? I don't think I don't think so. I think it was supposed to be the same. The Princeton reverb we talking about? Uh, uh, yeah, he said sixty five Princeton reissue. I'm not sure if it was the reverb or not. The reverb it was supposed to be the same. There was an issue we found with the, the cabinet had a buzz in it. And we had to put another rail across the top. The original one didn't. Hmm. And the, the baffle was buzzing, but no, it it was supposed to be the same. The main difference was the fact that it was a circuit board instead of a turret board and uh, the safety stuff. We had to add some additional safety components on the line input. Yeah. I, laid, I laid that board out actually just the way the turret board parts were laid in. With yeah, I don't, I don't. I don't think there's any difference between a, that and orig an, an original one, other than you know newer tubes, other than a different speaker, probably speaker, than the original, yeah. Yeah. Uh, which could be more scoop sounding, yeah, you know. Because yeah. I mean, I know the speakers won't be exact. No, they're never exact. No, never, never exact for the old ones. No. I'm surprised the question hasn't come up about the EVH four by twelve cabinet. Oh, what about, about it? Uh, it's it's rated at 80 watts, and it's a 100 watt amp. Mm. But those yeah, speakers, but, those speakers but, in there really can handle more of that power. Yeah, yeah, but the speakers were were from heritage. Well, came from heritage Celestian Heritage twenties, the G twelve, yes, and that's why they were rated at eighty watts. But I was told from Celestian, in reality, those really are 25 watt speakers. Yeah. I, so, it, yeah, it's, it's crazy. Wolfgang used to play bass through them yeah, and they right. wouldn't blow. So, I, it's not really an issue. Yeah. Crank mm. it. Go for Crank it. Crank it. Should be fine. <laughs> Jason, thank you very much for the super chat. Uh, hey, all, Dave, I took guitar lessons from Bobby Michigan at Motor City Guitar. Met Marty a bunch of times. Such a great guy. I believe I met you also in the early 2000s. Great show. Thank you. Awesome, Jason. Uh, I don't know who Bobby is exactly, but hey, I know who Motor City Guitar and Marty, though. Uh, Paul N., do you guys train or offer training to do mods? Obviously, SIG mods have to be covered by no disclosures or something. Just wonder what a guy that would like to do that. 
Oh man, you know, uh, no, but maybe. <laughs> well, you can reach. You can reach out to Paul. Uh, no, sorry, uh, to uh, Bruce Egnator. Oh yeah, you know, yeah, you should go take Bruce Egnator's amp building class if you want to kind of get a get a uh, a little lesson in Yaney sort of little kind of amps. Yeah. Yeah, I, I thought take... about offering that tone uh, full stack as a kit. Oh yeah. The way I do it, uh, I have to actually break the controls out. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. Otherwise, yeah. you got to take the whole main board out. That's oh no, forget that. Yeah, forget that noise. That 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 <laughs> that's, that's sort of ugly. I've seen that in there. It's like, oh no, I don't want to take that out. <laughs> There's 25 <laughs> screws that hold the board in. Yeah, no. Well, yeah, yeah I decided even after I did a, a video and a thing, it's it's too it's too involved. Yeah. You know, it's it's just too much for. And then there's the safety issue. People, they don't understand four or five hundred volts. And there's people that do, but I didn't want to open myself up to liability stuff. Sure. So, yeah, that makes sense. Understandable. I mean, I love to teach stuff like that. You know. It's, yeah. Uh, but it, it's hard to do and sell it. You know, like. Yeah. I, mm -hmm. I started building kits, Heath kits, when I was a kid. You know, fifteen. 15 I've got one in here right now, an old amp that uh, my brother had for a while. I'm revamping it. Heath kit. Those, those kits, they, the You're lot of dating yourself there. Yeah, uh, <laughs> yeah. I built a lot of kits. Heath, night kits, Heath kits, Dyna kits. In the, old, in the old days when you get cool stuff. Yeah, when you get cool stuff. Those are <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Gary Miner has a question. What are the main differences that make the EVH2 brighter than the EVH3? EVH2. Are you talking about the... Is that the PV, PV one? The yeah. PV, PV uh, 5152 are you talking about? I don't think 2 is necessarily brighter than 3. I don't think so either. But one thing I did know is it has more of a fizziness to it. There's, yeah. there's bleed... There's bleed, bleed. And that's a that's a circuit board layout issue, I think. Hmm. But I, I don't think it was specifically designed to be brighter than the three. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe I don't know. Uh, unfucking believable. What's up? Uh, thank you. Recently took a Strat Plus to Sherlin for work. Recognized how and was very nervous to even say hello. He was what? very cool and took the time to shake my hand and then went back to work on the mess he had torn apart. Mesa, yeah. you had twenty months. Sorry, my unfavorite. <laughs> no one likes to work on those. Yeah, yeah, they're, they're, they're hard to work on. They really are. <laughs> I, 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 uh, a, a guy that, um, a friend of mine, um, was the Mesa lead tech in Hollywood, Mesa Boogie Tech in Hollywood for twenty five uh -huh. years, ran yeah. the Hollywood store here. And anything, and he does work for me sometimes on Saturdays here. Um, and any anything Mesa that comes in, it's like, here you go, John. <laughs> <laughs> Have like fun. Some of my bench. <laughs> it, you know, but he worked on every one for 25 years, so he knows them like the back of his hand. He knows all the little shortcuts, mm. and and he knows right away what's wrong or what probably went wrong. Because I've got a five. It's called a five fifty five watt fifty watt. Uh huh. Uh, I'm on my bench right now, and I, I cannot figure out what's going on. Turn the gain up, and it just goes bananas. Psh, oh, crazy! Well, I can always hook you up with him. You can talk to him about yeah, it. He might have an idea. Great. He might have an idea at least to give you a little something. Yeah, yeah. He'll send it to me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You have to give me um or email me your 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 phone number and stuff, and I, I can hook you guys up. Okay, thanks. Yeah, email. Kurt Snyder, can you vary act the EVH amp to 90 volts? Uh, yes. No. <laughs> Not the new ones. I, no I mean, I, I've lowered, I put the amp on a variac and lowered it. Um, uh, one of the new ones to 90 volts? Yeah. Well, I'm surprised the regulators didn't all drop out. It didn't shut. No, if it, if it went any lower, then it was shut off. Okay. But, all right. That's some it. amps you can make it down, some amps that have regulators, you can make it down to maybe 100. Yeah, and and I'm but 90, that. 90, yeah, my amp shut low. down. Yeah, that's pretty low. Yeah, yeah. Does your I mean, amp have regulators, Dave? 
they're tested. Uh, yeah, twenty uh, percent, ten percent, one hundred eight, one thirty-two. To do right. to do any channel switching amp, generally speaking, you have regulated. Well, I have regu regulated two peters, DC two peters. Oh, you do. Uh, and uh, yeah, ours are actually regulated, and uh, and the relays also power off of that right. same. same and EVH, system. all the preamp tubes at EVH are regulated. They're mm -hmm. they're strong in two two sets. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 12 point, yeah, twelve point six volts each. Two series, three series sets. So if one tube goes. The other one quits. I know that's kind of a pain in the ass. Yeah, but you know, yeah, we do ours at twelve volts, and we just yeah, we don't do that. So yeah. we do the DC just because it's quieter. Yeah. Well, of course, running yeah. AC all around the board is no, forget it. Not a good. <laughs> no, but no, ninety no. volts. I'm surprised it worked that low. It worked, but I, I will say that I don't find the need to do it. Yeah, right. I just did, I just did it to just to see if it would work. But, see if it but, would work. Yeah, I mean, but but once I started getting a too low, the light started to dim and everything just, you know, shut off. So did um, any of your amps, Dave, ever have the the lower filament voltage in production? Did you ever? Do Not that? in production. No, I could easily do it though. Yeah, right. Because uh, because it's like I said, it's twelve volt DC regulated. Uh, oh, it does it, does it on the power tubes too? Oh, okay. Oh, not the power tubes, no. Okay, not the, yeah. Not the okay. power tubes and not the phase inverter too. Okay, right. yeah, that's the same as well. It's a couple of my amps have the phase inverter tube done also, but okay. Right. Most right. of the time, it's the phase inverter and the power tubes are AC, AC, and then everything else is DC. Yeah, that's what we twelve do. volt regulated DC, right? Which actually is maybe a little less than twelve volts. Yeah. Anybody from bad going to? to nam no okay i don't go to nam anymore nam is done i i maybe i'll go visit maybe <laughs> do they still do two a year or is this one a year now? oh well i i they're this year it's in april april um i i, I you know part of me is like yeah let's go see what's going on just to see how awful it is uh <laughs> and then the other part of me is like you know the funny thing last year I, I got a ticket i was gonna go down on a sunday or something and then my wife said to me hey you want to go blood do blah 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 and i'm like going yeah i want to go do that <laughs> and i didn't go <laughs> didn't go. Fuck it. i didn't go so um i don't know you know the heyday of it i think is gone i think the need for nam is gone um, you know, originally years ago, okay, when I started going to NAM in 1988 or something, before, you know, pre-internet and, you know, this is how the stores found out about new stuff, you know, this is, they came and visited and, and looked at the, you know, their vendors, new stuff, and, and this is how they got that information. So as the years go on in now 2023, with the dealers can will find out about this information before NAM. They'll see videos of it. They'll see everything they want to know about it probably in a better light with the videos than if they saw it even at the NAM show. Mm -hmm. What's the purpose? Mm -hmm. What's the purpose other than spending a lot of money? Yeah, that you don't make... get back. Not really. And time. Um, and time. You know, you had. Yeah. I mean, I love. I love it for the social part of it. I think it was great. Mm -hmm. um you know Lots we, of fun. we always did it right we had you know a sound room and we had a bar in our sound room man yeah, made, made it made it fun lots of fun <laughs> made, made it made it fun and you know you're talking to so many people in a day having those cocktails is quite nice because <laughs> they made the day after a while it. you're you just i mean even even with that i would get to the point during the day that I was like, I got to walk away. <laughs> I have to walk away for a little while because if I have to shake hands, I mean, this isn't bad towards anyone, but if I have to shake hands and smile and take a picture with one more person, I'm going to freak out. <laughs> yeah. it. I, I just needed a break for a minute. You know, it's just like, um, it, 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 it's punishing 
uh, th- you know, three day, four days, right? Four. It was four days. It was four days. Yeah. It was a punishing four days. All day, and then you know you're setting up the day before. You're tearing down the day after. It was punishing. Yeah, it's like rough. you know, six days roughly. And, and uh, you know, yeah, I don't yeah. blame you. Uh, Rock guitar school. Thank you for the super chat. Uh, this is a good question. Hi, Howard. Were there any mods in Eddie's personal 5150s that were never in production? And was there any feature that you would have preferred in the final product? Thank you. Hmm. Well, <clears throat> I don't recall anything that we modified for him that didn't wind up in production. Yeah, no. Except not... possibly my idea of initially wanting to have channel two and three combine instead of one but we never put that in front of him yeah well so, no yeah no everything that we changed was moving towards a product a production product yeah or production was, change yeah, yeah yeah and it was it was an evolution of everything it wasn't nothing was like redone ground up like mm-hmm. the iconic now that james brown did that's that's pretty much ground up totally right. different um, also a different form factor. I don't know if you guys let, me, let me ask you a question about that amp. So uh, is it a tube phase inverter and tube power amp? Yes. Yes. And then no, it, it, it might be not a tube phase inverter. No, I don't think it is. I think oh, it's okay. Tube power amp, tube power no amp with, with some sort of drive, some sort of solid state driver for the yes, yeah. And there's and then there's a com you know, the oh, I wasn't isn't there only there's one preamp, one additional preamp tube, I think. Yeah. Maybe two. The front end is all solid state. But yeah. It has a, a tube uh, distortion type emulator, uh, asymmetrical distortion uh, on, on the front end. Well, that's and neat. James Brown is very good at that kind of stuff. Yeah, that's neat. Well, he always made some really good um, yeah, he's, uh, pedals he's, he's that pretty, sounded amazing. He knows what he's doing. Yeah. Like, yeah. He does. I'm not, I don't think it's a tube face splitter, but I might be wrong. Oh, okay. You know, I'm just there's, there's, you know, there's a head, an 80 watt head, and I think it's a, is it a 60 watt combo or I'm not sure, or maybe a 40 watt combo. Uh, out there, I have out the right combo. Here. I think it's a 40 watt combo. 40 watt. Yeah. Um, I have the combo and it's great. Mm-hmm. Really, really great amp. Um, this is an interesting question. Why did EVH drop Marshall? Did he ever say to you guys at Fender? I have no idea. He was never with Marshall. so no, I didn't think he Yeah, he can't drop Marshall if he was never with Marshall. Uh, why that right. never... Why why that didn't happen a million years ago is beyond my comprehension. Right. Why Marshall didn't do that with yeah. him? Yeah, would have made sense, huh? It would have made a lot of sense. They didn't do any signature amps though at the time. No. no. And uh, I, you know, it would have made a lot of sense at the time. Mm-hmm. It it would have. That's for yeah. sure. Yeah. Um. Question. Um. How is Ed's hearing? How is his hearing? Yeah. I mean, did did I, I was I was amazed how good his ears were, especially yeah. all those years of loud. Loud, very loud sound. That some people get through that. I, you know, I don't. I never, I never had to repeat things to him. You know, just talking in normal volume. Yeah. You no. Know, so. I agree. Me, was there, there, there was a little time when he got a little damaged on one of the tours, and 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 towards the end of the years, that he had some issues. Like he had a monitor that blared out at him but his hearing oh. yeah i never i never had him ask what i said or anything yeah same here the telltale sign generally speaking if someone's losing their hearing is if you just talk to them normally and they're like wait what'd you say what'd you say uh, <laughs> yeah what'd you say what'd you yeah. say uh and i have many many musician friends that are like that yeah and some yeah. of them extremely bad mm-hmm. where you know okay if i'm going to talk to you i'm going to have to raise my voice <laughs> <laughs> quite loud uh will the real uh thank you uh where did where to get education for amp troubleshooting i have a background in comp size do own guitar wiring 
uh, education that detail how to trace signal through an amp test component oh, to determine a fault. Oh, man, that's that's. I don't know if there's any classes on it. I don't think. I mean, I, I you know there there's there's books out there that are quite um, quite good. Um, uh, Merlin Merlin uh, Belcourt or whatever. I don't know how to say his last name. Uh, he has some books that are out there that are great. Uh, there's some. Yeah, who's that guy in Canada that does the the loose leaf? London books? Power. Stuff. London Power yeah, right. I mean, some of his books were actually informative and stuff. Right. Uh, you know, if you're trying to learn stuff, you just try to gra grasp anything that's out there that you can right. that you can read and at least explain. Merlin out of the UK though is uh, the Valve Wizard. He was known as. He has a oh, website yeah. and uh, he he's written a bunch of really good. Um, really good books even the math and everything very informative um you just gotta dig man <laughs> you know it's yeah. it's like it's you gotta want it and you gotta dig for the information you gotta you gotta find the information wherever you can and there's and gotta, gotta be gotta videos your, and you gotta get your hands in stuff and, and there's yeah. you know youtube stuff where some people might explain some stuff i don't even I don't know. know i don't look at that anymore I should, but I've, i thought about doing that you know when one thing I always recommend is uh, never change two things at once. So if you're if you're doing some kind of swapping a component mm -hmm. one at a time, you don't and change listen. all the tubes. Right, you know. right, exactly. Yeah. I, well, how to troubleshoot? That's a whole another thing. Like I yeah. have to deal with this. I do all the customer service for my company. Uh -huh. uh, yeah. The blessing and a curse, probably. <laughs> yeah. uh, um, but I, my, my concept behind that is, well, if someone else does it, they're going to wind up asking me anyway, right? The person, right. Hey, this guy's having this problem. Can you ask, you know, why don't I just answer the email? <laughs> right. right. So, and I, and I do it routinely throughout the day. So I, I, you know, I get up in the morning coffee. Okay. Answer all my emails, clear it out. You know, maybe midday, I might do it again later, maybe in the evening when I'm sitting at home doing nothing, I do it again. So I'm always working apparently. Yeah. <clears throat> um, yeah, I worked I, recently with a guy in Sao Paulo, Brazil, and one guy way up in Alberta because he couldn't yeah. get the rooms. Yeah. And we did a video troubleshooting session. And I said, you just, have to just follow my instructions yeah and exactly with it right away some, got, some, yeah yeah sometimes some do that, they could listen yeah <laughs> yeah but not all not all because right. often i will say verbatim what i want you to try in an email and yeah. i'll get he'll take one part of it and give me the answer i go what right. about the other questions i asked you <laughs> so you know the important thing is when you're trying this unplug everything from your amplifier right oh Speaker yeah your cable uh, to a cabinet right. maybe if you have two cabinets let's try the other cabinet also uh -huh. and uh uh if you have an extra speaker cable you never know i've seen bad speaker cables uh, right. uh but nothing in the loop and nothing in front of the amp guitar straight in you sound like you're writing what i've written a hundred times yeah and then <laughs> then it's like i'm getting a lot of buzz okay hold on Unplug the guitar from the amplifier. Right. <laughs> Are you getting buzz now? No, there's no buzz at all. Well, there you go. Okay, well, that's called EMF. Your right. guitar pickups are picking up noise in your room or thing. Well, what do I do about that? Well, you're kind of screwed, maybe. <laughs> because off, there's not much you can do about it. Um, there's not a really good fix of it. If your area is particularly prone to it, it's going to be there. You could turn everything right. off in your entire house and it might still be there. Yeah, especially uh, if they're fluorescent lighting. And then mm -hmm. if you have dimmers. Dimmers, yeah. All the way up or all the way down. Right. Well, I don't have any dimmers in this room, but I have some upstairs. I go, well, are they dimmed? <laughs> <laughs> because guess what? It's all tied into the electrical system and it'll buzz in your basement. <laughs> um. You know, just things, just things like this, and and you know, just kind of narrow it down. Okay, is the crackling you're hearing from the amp? Mm -hmm. Turn all your masters and everything tone controls down to zero. Are you still hearing crackling from the amp? Yeah. Okay. Well, it's could be your power tubes then. Yeah. You know, uh, or 
well, I turned the master down. I don't hear the crackling anymore. Okay, well, it's before the master. <laughs> <laughs> you know, just narrowing it down to the the spot, and and that's 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 the, the key. So it's a, seri a series of diagnostic questions. Yeah. And the worst yeah. thing for me on my amp on my amps. The mains fuse is located in the bottom of the IEC inlet oh. jack. Yeah, that hidden place. There's an HT fuse next to it. Yeah. It says HT fuse. And the above the other one, it says mains fuse. Yeah. Well, I checked the fuse, it's good, but the amp still doesn't power on. You're yeah. checking the wrong fuse. Wrong. Mm -hmm. The mains fuse is located in the tray slide out tray of the iec inlet jack and there's a spare in there too well how do i how do i get that open oh <laughs> get a little oh, yeah. screwdriver and just kind of pop, pop it, it open and yeah. and so i got so pissed off about this all the newer amps i'm designing i put the ht fuse in the amp like marshall does <laughs> There's only one place on the app now that they can look. <laughs> oh, wow. Interesting. Uh, John DeShane, thank you. Did anyone along the way say to Ed, too much gain? He seemed to go off the rails with the gain. Did anyone suggest his ears might be tired? I didn't. I don't know. <laughs> you don't. You, 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 that's not okay. You don't want to go again. I, I, I knew not to go. Yeah, He's a wrong personality. You know, You're wrong personality. Yeah. You uh, you didn't tell Ed what he needed. He told you right. what he needed. That's it, right? And that's really, that's really the the key right there. The whole key, and oh, yeah. how and how you you know survive the camp is listening. Yes, that's listening. It. Just listen. Yeah. Listen to what he has to say, mm -hmm. and then yeah. interpret. Stephen Douglas, Howard, did did you have anything to do with the Fender Landau Deville? No, no, not me. Everything past uh, my last twelve years has been all EVH. So those ones that I went over, the mm -hmm. amp, the Princeton Reverb, GDAC Junior, the Ultralight, those are the Fender things that I did. Maybe maybe one more. I don't. It's a long time. You know, Eighteen years is a long time. Yeah. <laughs> For everything. Yeah. Uh, George Borden, thank you. Thank you for that for this episode. One of the best so far. Rest in peace, EVH and Jeff Beck. Yes. Yeah. Yep. Oh yeah, Jeff. We lost Jeff. Yeah. Uh, Jim A fifty one fifty. I'm having a hard time getting Fender to send me a new red power light bulb for my fifty one fifty three combo. Any ideas? They want me to take it to a service place, and it's out of warranty. Yeah. Well, that's a simple fix. I mean. Well, uh, it's not that simple, but this no. is the pilot light that's on the front. I'm assuming he's talking about. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But there was a while where uh, we couldn't get those particular LED versions. So they started building it with incandescent bulb versions. And I'd have to know the serial number. He could send me the serial number and I could try and pinpoint which one's in there. Or I could tell him what to do to tell me which one's in there. Yeah. So, yeah, have him send me an email. Yeah, reach out to Howard. Yeah, I could help with that. Cool. Yeah. I thought a pilot light would be easy. You, um, yeah. yeah these are, he Ed wanted that very special, huge LED round thing, mm -hmm. which I think was like, it's been through a couple different vendors, actually. Hmm. And, uh, um, let's see. I'm just, it's not just a number 47 bulb. Which hmm. even those are hard to get now. Yeah. Uh SIGs. Howard, what was Ed's favorite preamp and power tubes for the EVH amps? Well, before the hundred uh, before the 50 watt, they were experimenting with electroharmonics preamp tubes. Uh power amps, same thing. But when I took over, he had already fixed everything, fixated on JJ. So everything that I did was all JJ. Oh, except uh, the wing C power tubes for about six months. Mm. And then a Shuang. Is that how you say it? Shuang or something Until like that. Until they went away. And I think on the power tubes, they're back to JJ again. 
because yeah. we're having trouble getting those other ones. Mm. So yeah, wing seas were. I I like the sound of the wing seas. Mm. Yeah. But they were just they were very expensive and hard. And then they stopped making them. I guess we bought all. I think they bought all the stock up too. Uh, George Borden, thank you, Dave, for the dirty uh, Shirley Buxom boost combo. Perfect one channel rock machine that goes from light to loose to tight. Perfect combo. Awesome. Cool. Awesome. You made somebody happy there. Or a lot of people. Go. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Guitar Man 45 says he's got to go. He'll be back, though. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Next session or tonight? <laughs> I just want. I, do I don't think idea. he'll be back tonight, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, let's see. Unless he's just going to the bathroom. <laughs> oh yeah, that could be. He's just letting us know that he had to step away. Um, Leonard Rodriguez, how's it going? Thank you. We need a bad weekend or experience. How cool would that be, Dave? Like, you know, you guys have your own bad experience with wampler and friedman and you know all the different brands yeah i mean that that might be something that could be done maybe i don't know you know how, who's gonna come i don't know i mean i'd be there <laughs> <laughs> so, there's enough uh, brands yeah definitely uh we talked about this earlier michael uh Freeman will not be presenting or have a booth there, but Dave might be walking around, maybe. 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 I'm yeah, questioning that, but yeah, maybe. That's interesting. I, I did not know this about dimmers um, affecting signal. Well, not if they're studio dimmers, which are very X. <laughs> <laughs> But the standard ones you just buy at the hardware store to put in your wall, yeah, they're going to... It'll go... <laughs> That's the sound it'll do. Uh, uh, Will was saying, I wasn't talking about the outside of the amp. I mean, testing all jacks, pots, etc. Effects loops, send is okay, but preamp drops out. Found cold solder gent joint next to cathode. How to trace signal. Mm. Oh, well, I mean, you would have to understand the signal path and be able to read the schematic yeah you know kind of and 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 know where where it's cutting out you know and have some maybe equipment to diagnose that like a scope or i mean even a signal generator and a multimeter would be helpful <laughs> you know and the bare bones you can at least tra trace ac signal through through the circuit if you knew where to do that with the points you know um i had one amp builder tell me <laughs> i had one amp builder tell me oh i don't use a scope really yeah <laughs> exactly <laughs> and i and i go he was repairing one of my amps and i asked him I go, okay, can you put a signal generator to the in, into the input and then measure, you know, look at it on the scope, see what's going on, measure, you know, measure a few things. Well, I don't have a signal generator or a scope. I'm like, what? <laughs> <laughs> I get troubleshooting. Okay. And, 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 and like, like I said, at least a signal generator and a meter would be helpful. <laughs> hmm. At least then I could guide you. Just put a signal into it and check here, 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 and tell me what you're reading. I, you know, I just basic signal. You know, does it at at the EQ is at 20 volts or whatever the voltage is, 23 volts or whatever it should be AC. Um, he was telling me that, and I'm like, oh, okay, <laughs> okay, I don't know, what to tell you that, man uh george peterson we actually answered this earlier why is the 50 watt el34 version of the blue channel different than the 100 watt uh that's because that's what ed wanted and they and put that and there's no plans to make them the same and no no plans to make them the same they will stay the same they will stay different and if you want it the same then you can cut out that capacitor right uh yes yeah yeah uh rummy 
Thank you so much. Howard, are you familiar with the contemporary players using a tube screamer with the EVH? The purpose is to reduce the bass to have a cleaner gain sound? No, I'm not. No. Tube screamer up front, I guess they're talking about. It. Yeah, tube yeah. screamer up front. They turn the gain off and it's just like a boost, but it's, you know, it's kind of mid-range centric. So so it, it, it acts as a high pass filter sort of. Yeah. So it's a little, little tighter, little. It's common with the metal guys. Okay. All right. Uh, stay curious. Uh, what amps tend to sound good with G12 T75 speakers? Hmm, mm, not many. G12, <laughs> not many. Uh, you know, I, okay, I'll have to say that. Um, so, uh, speaking about Ed, so when he recorded the um for the fuck album, the for unlawful carnal knowledge record with Andy Johns producing, uh. He used a Soldano amp into a slant cabinet that at the time was rented from Andy Brower's studio rentals, which had 75 watt uh, speakers in it. Oh, yeah. And with the Soldano, actually, it worked pretty well. Mm -hmm. uh, a little cleaner sounding of a speaker, not less fuzzy, mm -hmm. so to speak, than a Vintage 30 or a, a Greenback, which, which actually makes sense because the Soldano is a little bit more of a fuzzier gain. So it kind of makes sense. And he later bought that cabinet from Andy Browers. Hmm. I remember taking that cabinet to the studio at that time because I worked for Andy Browers at the time. Is that the first time you met Ed when you brought yeah. the cabinet? Yeah. Yeah. He helped me unload it from the car. Oh, cool. <laughs> That's awesome. Must have um, been 1980. When was that record made? When did that record come out? Um, Had to be like 89 ish or something that i i did that or i would think i was thinking 90 but maybe i'm wrong might have come out in 90 but it might be recorded uh, in 80, 89. Right, right uh josh hey howard is it okay to use my 100 watt evh amp into a 2 by 12 evh i'm using it really low volume low volume you should be fine sure if you're really worried about it you could two pull pull outer tubes mm -hmm. on the 100 watt and set it to half the impedance. Then it'll be a 50 watt amp. If he's really worried about it. But just don't turn it up. You'll, you'll hear when it starts to be not right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Might, yeah, if you, you blow it, it up, very long. Know. Yeah, you wouldn't do it for very long. Mm -hmm. uh, they aren't human. Possible to mod a 100 watt stealth 6L6 to use other power tubes, I imagine you're saying. Uh, uh, probably not. That would. It's It's pretty involved. You have to you change, have to the, change uh, the bias. The, no, not the, the no? bias. The the, the uh, screen resistors are different. Mm -hmm. yeah, there's a lot of lot of little things. Yeah. Okay. Uh, but it, you know, it's possible. I could do it if he sends it to me. There you go. There you go. <laughs> there you go. Howard can do it. Uh, Robert McDonald, how when changing preamp tubes in the 51, 53, 50 watt is V1 that sensitive? It seems no matter what tubes use, it's very microphonic. Thanks, fellas. This is the best. Well, V1 is the highest gain tube, so if it's you've got a microphonic tube and then that's not good, you got to get it out of there. Is that what he's sort of getting at? Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, you know, so are you using JJ tubes is is the question. I mean, you yeah, know, right. you're going to want to use JJs probably. They're going to be the lowest, least microphonic. Right. I would also maybe recommend buying several of them so you can kind of find the lowest Swap microphonic them there, one. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, but Some of these guys, you know, microphonic to them is like they whack the tube and see what happens. You know, that's, you know, it's, you don't want to I be mean, whacking the tubes real a lot <laughs> i mean a little micro microphonic you know i always i always say when you um, plug the guitar cable into it if it's pinging a little too much you, you know or, <laughs> but really really yeah. though if you, if it's still not running away it's not too bad yeah. it's it'll be okay now, w yeah. when it starts feeding back on itself yeah then and then that's when it's way. really bad but you can get away with a little microphonics you know yeah. as long as no. you know it's, it's it's okay it's not going to hurt anything uh what are your thoughts on using a brown box with non-vintage amps i use it i use a brown box with my um with with all my amps oh, back 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 here 
All these amps are wired. What's that? What's the the regulator box? Yeah, it basically lowers the vo- lowers the voltage oh, okay. slightly. It's uh, des- it's it's designed like if you have you know if you're somewhere in the U.S. you got 126 volt 126 volt wall voltage, okay. you can drop it down to 120 or 118 or something, and yeah. you know make it make it a little sweeter. I've got mine at 115. Mm-hmm. Yes, sure. if you if brown box is great, you can use it on any amp. Uh, and yeah, if you have 125 volt wall voltage like you had, it's it's beneficial. Definitely, definitely yeah. beneficial. Yeah, definitely. Um, yeah. nothing sounds good at 125. It's it's harsh sounding. It's too, yeah, it's too hard. Too, and too hard. um, and yeah, uh, running 116. Yeah, that's a great voltage. You know, just a little bit, a little bit under 120 is kind of cool. A couple volts. Mm-hmm. It's great. Uh. Chris Leeton, hey Dave, just purchased his twin sister. Can you recommend a delay for the loop? Uh, I like. I'm I'm a big fan of the Boss DD500 or DD200 delays. Those are great. Um, the Halo Keeley Halo. Halo's good in the twin sister. The twin sister has like a wide open uh, effects loop return, right? Mm. So there's a lot of return gain on on that um so um it tends to amplify noises of pro certain products so like if it's not extremely low noise floor uh you're gonna hear the kind of hiss from the product a little bit hmm. you can fix that if it had a ideally if i should have put a return volume on that amp um but i didn't uh so you want something that's really low noise the halo the halo is great uh but it might be a little you might hear a little hiss there i i the boss stuff i know is good mm. strymon stuff would work pretty well uh even tide would be hissy mm. so interesting there you have it uh stephen douglas dave what could cause a buzz when the the Ernie Ball volume tuner is in the off position, but perfectly quiet when full volume. Pedal is in the loop of a Bogner 20th anniversary oh, Shiva. Oh. Um, Ernie Ball volume pedal, volume pedal, I'm assuming, right? Yeah. Ernie Ball volume. It's a volume tuner pedal. Um, Well, the first question is: I since I've never used one of those things yet, I've seen them for for a while now. Is it a high impedance pedal? If it's a high impedance pedal, the buzz, uh, the lowering it in the effects loop could cause a buzz. Uh, if it's a, I doubt it's a low impedance. I'm not sure if it's buffered. I don't know anything about that pedal. Hmm. If it's buffered, it shouldn't cause a problem. Um, the Shiva though loop is notoriously flaky. So, generally speaking, everyone that I've worked on, you have to attenuate. Bogner would always in the back panel like att- attenuate the signal down to pedal level, and then there was a boost circuit. It's a really wacky loop in that amp, so could have issues with that. Uh, Robert Constantino, you bought my EL34 50 watt. Oh, cool. And you did the uh, C137 mod. Awesome. Um, which 5153 version is your favorite and why? I like the one, 100 EL34 the most. Howard, thanks for helping with me with the TC Nova system and the loop. I don't remember that, but uh, which amp do I like the best? Yeah. I like the 6L6 combos the best. Oh, cool. Because they have the, I just, they sound great. They've, they've got the the bright, the higher channel 2 is brighter, the articulation thing built in. Variable power is a nice feature. The reverb is really nice on that thing. Mm, cool. The, the, the downside is they weigh a ton, 95 pounds. Yeah, they're, yeah. <laughs> oh, God. Yeah, the icon. Otherwise, otherwise, the hundred, the fifty S is my favorite now of the heads. Yeah, I love the fifty. Got everything rolled in there, so 
Yeah. That's Except my for the, my, my mod, the full tone stack thing. Right. But that, you know, you don't really need that for most cases. You don't need all three channels independently. Yeah, it makes it really useful, though. Yeah. Yeah, yeah it does. Yeah. We'll be talking, Howard. <laughs> uh, Blake Burris, hey, man. How are you? Thanks for uh, watching. Um, we've got uh, Aaron Kane. By the way, guys, no more Super Chats if you can, because uh, we're going to wrap up in like 10 minutes. Um. Hey, Dave, been meaning to say thanks for help on the JCM Studio mods. Love the show. Keep up the great work. Oh, cool, cool, man. I don't know what I helped you with, but okay, cool. Uh, Jonathan Shop, Howard, do you have some all-time favorite EVH tones, a song, a solo, et cetera? No, not really. You know, before, before doing EVH, I was not an EVH fan. So I, you know, I don't, I haven't spent hours and hours and hours listening to his whole repertoire, but I, I more, I just like he's a, he's a master guitar player, and I just could listen to anything he plays. So a particular song, you know, doesn't, not something I could say. Okay. Which yeah. one I like the most? No but he's a master, you know, guitar player. You know. No doubt. Uh, Dustin Wilborn, hey Dave, what 10 inch speaker would you recommend for a butter slacks? Uh, uh green, 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 greenback tens, Celestian greenback tens, those sound great. Just be careful. There's not a lot of great 10 inch. Well, no, it's in a Marshall 810 cabinet. Oh, Marshall 810. I missed yeah. that. Yeah. <laughs> Shit. Second. Okay. Wow. Uh, <laughs> what, but, but you know, those 810s, I mean, doesn't it have, do you have the original speakers in it? Because those were great. Those are, those are cool caps. Wow. Eight by ten. Yeah. That thing must be huge. <laughs> it's tall. It's really tall. <laughs> it's really tall. <laughs> wow. Um, they're so cool, though. They're neat sounding caps. William Gallo, Howard, do you install concentric pots to the EVH Lunchbox one amp? Speaking specifically of the volume pot, if so, how can I reach you? No, I don't. I can't. I can't modify that one. There's just no no room to work. No. Nope. Ah, too bad. Uh, Patrick Miller, what guitar and speaker cables would you guys recommend? Oh God, <laughs> the rabbit oh, hole, Vinny. Yeah, go to Vinny. Sig uh, what, Signum. He, Signum. Signum cables. Vinny's great. He makes great cables, speaker cables, and guitar cables. All custom for you. Yep, anything you want, and it's high end stuff. Um, yeah, Signum guitar cables, check them out. Uh, let's see, Stephen Douglas, thanks, Dave. It's probably the loop of the Shiva that's causing the buzz because it's not noticeable in other amps. Well, maybe not. I mean, well, maybe yes. Um, again, I don't, I'd have to look at that pedal and see i don't know if the if the volume pedal part is a passive volume pedal and they're just tapping the tuner off of it they might very well be doing that uh if it is and it's a high impedance pedal it it's not going to work that well with the loop so it would be better to use a low impedance pedal i just don't know that much about it so mm. i don't know That's if i said this one do some did research I, did i say this one from aaron k yes sir. okay want to make sure just want to make sure um okay uh this one's for howard i'd like to use both an el34 and 6l6 51 53 with one 2 by 12 cab what would you recommend to switch the heads with one cab oh so he wants to switch between the two heads with one cab Oh well, there's a go back and forth between the two different heads. Uh, yeah, there, there's an amp switch. switch. Yeah. There's there's an amp switcher you can get. Yeah. Um, yeah. K uh, K uh, K H E amp switchers. Um, one thing to be aware of though is you don't ever want to have an EDH amp with an open driven cable because that's the worst thing for the tubes. Yeah, this would be yeah, safe. You have to be you have to ground the output or drive it. Yep, this is this is uh, the amp KHE yep. amp switchers. We'll do that. They make a bunch of different ones. Um, 
they make a little it's more than you need but they make a small uh a four by two amp switcher which is four heads two cabs okay it's a little yeah. half rack space box that'll do exactly what you need it to do it's midi okay. it's it's great and you can a b between amps into the same cab okay uh yeah. it might be a little more than you want to spend but i mean to be honest uh, radio makes a few boxes too but they won't they don't work that well mm -hmm. so this one does work well what's it called uh khe amp switchers they're out of switzerland okay and they make uh a whole variety of products that will do amp switching uh and you know in real time you know you can switch between 200 right. watt amplifiers going full tilt right uh into a four by twelve cabinet or something and it's it's great it's a very useful tool for uh, uh even a being things you know yeah, things, right. instantly you into the same cabinet you know you just don't want to have an edh amp full tilt with an open cable oh no this would this isn't this it isn't. takes care of that okay. yes gotcha perfectly safe well i think we've um we've hit all of our questions Right. And uh, I want to thank you, Howard, for coming on. It's been a pleasure meeting two you. Two hours. Yeah, yeah, two hours talking to you. Um, we probably can go on or have a part two at some point with you. Yeah, sure. Um, yeah. I would love to have you back. I enjoyed it. It was uh, good questions and hope I gave good answers. No, you were, <laughs> you were, you were fantastic. You were awesome. Yeah. Um, I want to thank everybody for watching who's been uh, viewing. Again, make sure you check out Sweetwater fixpedalboards.com hit subscribe. and howard's website and check out yeah. howard's website um yeah check out i'll post the link in our video also of howard's website so you guys yeah. can check it out and uh and reach out to howard um about all his mods uh to the evh amps and he'll he'll uh and what's the name of the shop you're working at again i forgot guitar pickers guitar in pickers Scottsdale, arizona gotcha cool it's on the front of the it's on the web page too Gotcha. Great. Uh, and then our next guest is, let's see, uh, February 10th. We've got Sean Tubbs and Derek from Rev who are going to be on, which, cool. uh, which will be cool. Um, and then from there, we got more people coming. So I really appreciate everybody watching. All right. Hope you guys, Thanks, yeah, Howard, hang on while we say goodbye. But everybody have a great, fantastic weekend. Really appreciate yep. it. Right. See you guys. Take care.